And now what we will get into uh, in the next chapter is we will start talking about artificial intelligence and this is titled as from the spring to the winter of AI. So I am going to talk about when was this boom in AI started or when is that people started th thinking and talking about AI seriously and what eventually happened to the initial boom and so on, right. So let us start with 1943 where as I was saying that there was a lot of interest in understanding how does the human brain work and then come up with a computational or a mathematical model of that, right. So McCulloch and Pitts, one of them was a neuroscientist and the other one was a logician, right. So no computer scientists or anything at that point of time. And they came up with this extremely simplified model that just as a brain takes the input from lot of factors, right. So now suppose you want to decide whether you want to go out for a movie or not. So you would probably think about do you really have any exams coming up that could be your factor x1. You could think about is the weather good to go out, is it raining, would it be difficult to go out at this point, would there be a lot of traffic, is it a very popular movie and hence tickets may not be available and so on, right. So a brain kind of processes all this information, you might also look at things like the reviews of the movie or the IMDB rating of the movie and so on and based on all these complex inputs, it applies some function and then takes a decision yes or no that okay I want to probably go for a movie. So this is an overly simplified model of how the brain works is and what this model says is that you take inputs from various sources and based on that you come up with a binary decision, right. So this is what they proposed in 1943. So now we have come to an artificial neuron, so this is not a biological neuron, this is how you would implement it as a machine, right. So that was in 1943. Then along and then this kind of led to a lot of uh, boom. Uh, in our interest in artificial intelligence and so on and I guess around 1956 uh, in a conference the term artificial intelligence was uh, formally coined and within a one or two years from there Frank Rosenwald came up with this perceptron model of uh, doing computations or what perceptron model of what an artificial neuron could be and we will talk about this in detail later on the course, I will not tell you what these things are as of now, just think of the a new model was proposed and this is what he had to say about this model, right. So he said that the perceptron may eventually be able to learn, make decisions and translate languages. Do you find anything odd about this statement? Yeah. So learn and make decisions make sense, but why translate languages, why is so specific, why such a specific interest in languages? So that you have to connect back to history, right. So this is also the period of the Cold War and there was always, always a lot of interest, a lot of research in translation was actually fueled by the World War and events that happened after that where these uh, countries which were at loggerheads with each other, they wanted to understand what the other country is doing but they did not speak each other's language. So that is why there was a lot of interest from espionage point of view or from spying and so on to be able to translate languages and hence that specific required and a lot of this research would have been funded from agencies which are interested in these things, right, in the defense or war or something, right, okay. So and this work was largely done for the Navy and this is an, ex, uh, this is an uh, extract from the article written in New York Times way back in 1957 or 58 where it was mentioned that the embryo of an, this perceptron is an embryo of an electronic computer that the Navy expects will be able to walk talk, see, write, reproduce itself and be conscious of its existence. So I am not quoting something from 2017 or 18, this is way back in 1957, 58 right? and that is why I like the history part of it. So recently there is a lot of uh, boom or a lot of uh, hype around AI that AI will take over a lot of things, it will take over jobs, it might eventually, uh, we might be colonized by AI agents and so on. So I just want to emphasize that. I do not know whether that will happen or not, but this is not something new. We have been talking about the promise of AI as far back since 1957, 1958, right. This is not something new that people are talking about now. It is always been there and to what extent this promise will be fulfilled is yet to be seen. And of course, as compared to 1957, 58, we have made a lot of progress in other fields which have enabled AI to be uh, much more successful than it was earlier. For example, we have much better compute power now. We have lots of data now thanks to the internet and other things that you can actually 
crawl tons and tons of data and then try to learn something from a data or try to make the machine learn something from data. Right? So we have made a lot of progress in other aspects because of which AI is now at a position where it can really make a difference. But just wanted to say that these are not things which have not been said in the past. It has always been that AI has always been considered to be very promising and perhaps a bit hyped also. Right? So that's about 1957-58. Then now what we talk about nowadays, or the, for, for the past 8 to 10 years at least, uh, when we talk about AI, we're talking about deep learning and that is what this course is about, largely about deep learning. I'm not saying that other, and what deep learning uh, is largely about, if I want to tell you in a very layman nutshell term is, it's about a large number of artificial neurons connected to each other in layers. and functioning towards achieving certain goal, right? So this is like a schematic of what a deep neural network or a feed forward neural network would look like. Now this is again not something new which has come up in the last 8 to 10 years, although people have started discussing it a lot in the last 8 to 10 years. Look at it way back in 1965-68, suppose something which looked very much like a modern deep neural network or a modern feed forward neural network. And in many circles, he is considered to be one of the founding fathers of modern deep learning, right? So uh, that's about that. 68, right? From 1943 to 1968, it was mainly about the spring time for AI. And what I mean by that, that everyone was showing interest in that. The government was funding a lot of research in AI, and people really thought that AI could deliver a lot of things on a lot of fronts for various applications, healthcare, defense, and so on. And then around 1969, an interesting paper came out by these two gentlemen, uh, Minsky and Pappert, which essentially outlined some limitations of the perceptron model. Right? And we'll talk about these limitations later on in the course, in the second or third lecture. But for now, I'll not get into the details of that. But what it said that it is possible that a perceptron cannot handle some very simple functions also. So you're trying to make the perceptron learn some very complex functions, because the way we decide how to watch a movie is a very complex function of the inputs that we consider. But even a simple function like XOR is something which a perceptron cannot be used to model. That's what this paper essentially showed. And this led to severe criticism for AI and then people started losing interest in AI and a lot of government funding actually subsided after 1969, all the way to 1986 actually. This was the AI winter of connectionism, so there was very little interest in connectionist AI. So there are two types of AI, one is symbolic AI and the other is connectionist AI. So whatever we are going to study in this course about neural networks and all, that probably falls in the connectionist AI paradigm. And there was no interest in this and people, I mean, it's really hard to get funding and so on for these 17 to 18 years and that was largely triggered by this study that was done by Minsky and Pappert. And interestingly, they were also often misquoted on what they had uh, actually said in their paper. So they had said a single perceptron cannot do it. They, in fact, said that a multi-layer network of perceptrons can do it, but no one focused on the second part, that a multi-layer network of perceptrons. People started pushing the idea that a perceptron cannot do it, and hence we should not be investigating it, and so on. Right? So that's what happened for a long time, and this is known as the winter, or the first winter. Then around 1986, actually, came uh, this algorithm, which is known as backpropagation. Again, this is an algorithm that we are going to cover in a lot of detail in the course, uh, in the fourth or fifth lecture. And this algorithm actually enables to train a deep neural network, right? Uh, so a deep network of neurons is something that you can train using this algorithm. Now, this algorithm was actually popularized by Rumel at Rumelhart and others in 1986, but it was not uh, completely discovered by them. This was also around in various other fields, so it was there in, uh, I think in systems analysis or something like that. It was being used for other purposes in a different context and so on. And Rumelhart and others in 1986 were the first to kind of popularize it in the context of deep neural networks. And this was a very important discovery because even today, all the neural networks or most of them are trained using backpropagation, right? And of course, there have been several other advances, but the core remains the same that you use backpropagation to train a deep neural network. Right? So something this was discovered almost 30 years back is still primarily used for training deep neural networks. Right? That's why this was a very important uh, paper or uh, breakthrough at that time. And around the same time, so again, interestingly, so backpropagation 
uh, is used in conjunction with something known as gradient descent which was again discovered way back in 1847 by Cauchy and he was interested in using this to compute the orbit of heavenly bodies right because that is something that people cared about at that time. Today of course we use it for various other purposes one of them being discovering cats in videos or even for medical imaging or for describing uh, whether a, a certain type of cancer is being depicted in a x-ray or things like that. There's a lot of other purposes for which deep neural networks and hence, uh, and hence uh, back propagation, gradient descent and other things are being used for. Right? But again these are not very modern discoveries, these are dated way back 30 years and even gradient descent is almost 150 years and so on. Right? So that is uh, what I wanted to emphasize. And around the same time in 1990 or 1989, there is this another interesting theorem which was proved which is known as the universal approximation theorem. And this is again something that we will cover in the course, uh, in the third lecture or something like that, where we will talk about the power of a deep neural network, right. So again the importance of this or why this theorem was important will become uh, clear later on when we cover it in detail. But for now it is important to understand that what this theorem said is that if you have a deep neural network, you could basically model all types of functions, continuous functions to any desired precision. So what it means in very layman terms is that if the way you make decisions using a bunch of inputs is a very very complex function of the input, then you can have a neural network which will be able to learn this function, right. In very layman terms that is what it means. And if I have to hype it up a bit or I have to say it in a very enthused and excited manner, I would say that basically it says that ne deep neural networks can be used for solving all kinds of machine learning problems, right. That is roughly what it says but with a pinch of salt and a lot of caveats. But that is uh, what it means at least in the context of this course, right. So this is all around 1989 and despite this happening, right, some important discoveries towards the late end of 80s which was back propagation universal approximation theorem, people were still not uh, being able to use deep neural networks for really solving large uh, practical problems, right. And a few challenges there was of course the compute power at that time was not at a level where uh, it could support deep neural networks. We did not have enough data for training deep neural networks. And also in terms of techniques, while backpropagation is a sound technique, it is to fail when you have really deep neural networks. So when people tried training a very deep neural network, they found that the training does not really converge, the system does not really learn anything and so on. And there were certain issues with using backpropagation off the shelf at that time uh, because of which it was not very successful, right. So again, despite these slight boom around 86 to 90 where some important discoveries were made and even follow up in 92, 93 and so on, there is still not a real big hype around deep neural networks or artificial neural networks at that time. There was again a slump a slow winter uh, right up till 2006 